<laughs> Hello and welcome to uh, 66. This week we are discussing uh, creation myths, the uh, the myths that create worlds, or rather the myths of the things which created those worlds. Uh, with me today is uh, Chris Zenger, the creator of 66, uh, my wife, Emily Alice King, who is the illustrator for 66 Lovecraft, uh, Joshua Radford of 66 Sol, is he now? And um, Kristen, who is new, um, <laughs> and who we haven't really gotten to know yet. Uh, I, of course, am Patrick King, and uh, I'll pass you on to... Ah, yes, sorry. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'll pass you on to uh, Chris to do the main bulk of the meeting. Um, as always, uh, if you like what we're doing, feel free to like and subscribe to our videos. That's right, we're going to the check-ins. To Emily, uh, to Josh for the check-ins. <laughs> we just went through this. I am so sorry. We're going to Josh for the check-ins. You will be, mate. You will be. Okay. So, how is everyone doing? We'll go down the list, uh, but we'll start with our special guest, Kristen. How's your week been? It's been great. Um, what can I say? Gaming. Uh, well, getting started gaming. Going to be playing some Lorantha, so creation myth craziness abounds there. Um, I also, you know, started working, so I'm, like, tired, and I go back to work tomorrow. I don't want to work four to nine in the evening, but I have to. <laughs> oh, man, I, I just finished my working week, believe me. I've, I'm not looking forward to Monday. Yeah, tax season is evil. Very, very evil. <laughs> you can imagine. Chris? How's your new job anyway? I've not seen you for two weeks. Uh, yes, um, yeah, it's been quite an interesting week because my brand new full-time job suddenly changed into a two days a week freelance gig um, because the company I'm working with um, you lost a couple of clients rather unexpectedly. Um, so we have hopefully I will be back into sort of like full-time work quickly once they get themselves organised. But it was a bit of a, a bit unexpected. On the plus side, of course, that does mean I now have more time for 66 and also allowed me to finish and file my taxes because it's tax filing day uh, tomorrow in the uh, UK. And uh, without, you know, sort of like doing it two minutes before the deadline and, you know, 11.59 as I normally do it. So, you know, doing it one day before the deadline, I'm actually up on the game. So that's been my week. Right. Uh, Emily, how are you feeling? Um, good, I can now officially say it on uh, the channel. Um, me and Pat having a baby. <coughs> um, so yeah, it's been pretty okay few days. The morning sickness has returned. Um, but it's kind of not been there for two days, so that's a bonus. Kind of. <laughs> I don't have to respond to that, but from congratulations. <laughs> We're now going to have officially uh, have a 66 branded baby now, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> How are you? Uh, apparently, um, well, I I thought I was I was doing quite well, and then I embarrassed myself massively in in public just now. Um, I I did have an exam at work today. I'm going to blame that because my brain is is not in the right headspace. <laughs> but yeah, you yeah, know, I'm I'm good. We're uh, we're getting on with stuff. Um, nothing really bad's been happening, and we uh, yeah yeah can't say more than that. <laughs> It's a good job I didn't go for the uh, running the session today. <laughs> oh dear, 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 dear. Uh, as for myself, um, as I said, I, I think I said I wasn't here last week. So stock take at my workplace. Imagine a stock take warehouse sized. We finished Tuesday. We've been playing catch up ever since, and today has been a right day. So all, like, all things considered. Can't really complain too much. However, I've not left much time for 66 work. Um, however, me and Alex have thrown a few ideas around, and we have now got um, a solid reason for a time skip, which will make sense if we ever explain it in the uh, meetings. So, with further ado, I shall pass on to the person who's doing the bulk of the meeting, which I think is Chris, and I could be wrong. You're not wrong. It is me doing the bulk of the meeting. Uh, today, we are talking about creation myths. Um, basically, uh, Every society has a creation myth, which explains why those people are there. Um, this can be on a big scale, obviously, you know, let there be light, God created the heavens and all the rest of it, sort of level of creation myths. 
but it could be a lot smaller level because if you think about, say, the United States and the founding fathers, that is a creation myth. It, it sort of explains, it gives a sort of grounding to the society as to why they're there. And, you know, or the city of Rome, for instance, Romulus and Remus is a classic creation myth for a city. So creation myths can be big or small, um, but they're all about a society and really basically a, a gr grounding point, a starting point for that society and sort of helps define who they are. So tonight we're looking at creation myths, um, ideas for creation myths of any type, um, doesn't matter the setting, doesn't matter sort of like uh, what we do with them, but they're, they're there to be background to a, a world or a venture and to sort of, you know, just something to flesh it out, give it colour. So, creation myths, we're going to start tonight um, with Pat's creation myth, which Pat is interestingly called Angels with Plasma Guns. Pat, tell us more. Right, now you've embarrassed me. Okay, um, my, my creation myth is, is in the, the dead, the kind of the, the zenith future, basically. We, uh, we humankind, are, are building spaceships and we're flying out into the void. And what we discover out there in space is what we've always hoped would be true, that alien life exists, that life exists on other planets. What we also find out is what we've always feared is true, and that is that all of that life is much better than we are and, and very, very aggressive, relentlessly attempting to destroy us. At every turn, wherever humans go, there are bigger, nastier aliens than humans who are there to kill to, to kill them, to kick their asses. And basically what happens is humankind is fought into a corner. Earth is eaten by a, a massive alien um, called the Nanophage, which is essentially the antichrist of this, this world. And um, they, are, they are scattered to the winds uh, in colony ships, essentially like Battlestar Galactica almost, just trying to get away from, from this massive force of destructive aliens who are trying to destroy them. They find derelict spaceship. On the derelict spaceship they find four figures who turn out to be the archangels of Christian mythology, Michael, Gabriel, um, oh god I've forgotten the other two, but you know what I mean. They are the archangels of Christian mythology. They are our saviors essentially and they awaken and what they do then is they grant us power. They give us the grace of God, and we can use this to fight these these bad guys, uh, and and they that becomes our civilization. Uh, we we become essentially a a race in thrall to these protectors. Um, it's called angels with plasma guns because obviously they have very advanced technology which they use to to fight off these these aliens. That's that's the name for that, and because I like the phrase <laughs> angels. But, Okay. <laughs> it's, it's a good name. I, I love the name. I, I, I would certainly pick up a, a, a book called Angels of uh, Plasma Guns. So, so just, a, just a recap. So basically, sort of like in, in this harsh, violent universe, humanity has got scattered and is on the verge of destruction. But then they find these angels, or you know, these Christian mythos mythology, and they start that brings them back from the brink, and presumably this is a myth told sometime afterwards, so... Oh, absolutely, yes, yeah. So, so do you imagine that humanity has seriously kicked the angels' arse, not the angels, the aliens' arses, or are they, um, or is this sort of like, while the war is still ongoing, justifying why people are still the thing fighting? Is, with this idea, yes, this would be while the, the war is still ongo ongoing, and I had a kind of meta plot to this. Um, which I, we were, it will be something I want to talk about another time. I think we could actually dedicate a, a, a bit more of a meeting to that, or just you know I can just tell you about it some other time. But yes, we, it it is certainly while the war is still ongoing, there is still uh, a big galactic conflict ongoing between us and aliens who we've only just really gotten onto the level with. So there's still a lot more of them than us. Um, we've started to referring to them more in a biblical context, so we're not calling them angels anymore, we'd be calling them abominations or demons or her heretic races and things like this. But essentially, you, this, this, this version of humankind has been, be, uh, to them, have been given absolute benediction that they are in the right. 
because yeah. because the most the the highest authority of our culture ever has appeared and is on their side. <laughs> yeah, talk about being the chosen race, you know. Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, Kristen has uh, um, some um, questions, and she's punk pinged with uh, punged pinged uh, pinged with a uh, wonderful comment which involves slave space elves, which which I've got to know more about. Okay, um, you want to picture this? There was a you want to assume that uh, what we know as Earth, you know, Earth's history. Uh, there was a history before that. You want to say that there was super technological, superhuman advanced race floating around. They lived on Earth and they wanted some companionship because super special precursor race is special. Why not? We'll build we'll build some slaves. Um awesome awesome slaves that are like you know special. Um anyway, they uh after the first slave, Eve, who was female, uh, you know, have to start with a female somewhere, right? Uh, they, she, after a certain point, decides to upgrade all of the other slaves, her children, um, because there's like version 1.0, and then there's a 2.0, and it's like, okay, we all need to upgrade, um, because that's important. Secretly, it's an upgrade that will allow them at some point, at a predetermined time, that only she knows about. They get a signal. Everyone grabs their secretly packed bags and heads to the spaceships that they built secretly because their creator, their, hum their precursor creator decided, I really don't want to give, I want to give these guys a chance. And so they run into space. You know, ships take off. They go into space. There's like five or ten of them. Ten ships. But they're big colony ships. Um, sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, I want to point that out now. Uh, and so they get out into space. And they start colonizing other worlds. Uh, some of the ships get lost at some point. Like it's into a, a black hole or a space anomaly or whatever. So they lose some of those ships. Uh, the lost fleet. And eventually those ships turn up again. Mind you, it's been a couple hundred years. Uh, thank goodness these are long-lived space elves. <laughs> so the ships turn up and they bring them back. And it turns out the, these, these lost ships are now a super like warrior culture because they got sucked into wherever and they had to fight like space aliens. So you're thinking that sort of like the um, tying sort of like the ancient biblical stories of foundations um, into a sort of um, the, the alien things and actually th this spaceship which humanity finds and discovers these holy icons on and things like that is actually this precursor race of uh, pre-humans and it all sort of ties together and uh, sort of a, in, a, in a better way than Battlestar Galactica ever did. Yes, except for also the space elves show up at its door you know, like a millennia later and realize the precursors they left, they've been long gone. And they're like, huh, so the, these guys who were, you know, our working buddies are now running the planet? Oh, wait, and we're better than them? Revenge? No, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna have revenge. We're, we're just gonna, you know, show them how to be better because that's the right thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, Josh, you had some thoughts on this. We were discussing uh, two weeks ago the possibility of doing those like the short mini adventures. Sixty-six angels with plasma guns, mm -hmm. pretty much writes itself, and I think that's Pat's next project. I have so many next projects. <laughs> Wait until Apocalypse is out. Wait until Lovecraft is out. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm burning all suggestion of Pat writing anything else until he finishes Lovecraft. Lovecraft. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> behind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and uh, what about Pat, Pat, Pat's uh, inadequacies? Um, Emily, you've got, you've got something to throw in here? And not about um, Pat? <laughs> there's lots I could say about Pat. Um, I was just thinking, to me, it rings quite a lot of Warhammer 40k. The point that if we released it, some people might make quite a few comparisons. Um... Hmm. <laughs> I, 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 I have to say, 
I have to say that I, I can't comment on this because despite living in Nottingham, the home of uh, um, uh, Games Workshop, I've never ever played any Warhammer 40,000 game of any variety. I know nothing about the universe. But generally speaking, the trick is in the writing. You know, because yeah. there are only so many ideas um, out there. All ideas are like each other. This this idea was much more much more overtly biblical. Um, as I said, there is a bit of a meta plot to it, and part of that meta plot is that these these angels are almost a parasite race. They that 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 kind of utilise our our cultural heritage essentially to they 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 are not necessarily any better than the others. That's what I'd say. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, uh, so, uh, I think we could go further with that one. I'll look forward to more discussions about that because the title is fantastic. Um, so, but it's time to move on to Josh's uh, creation myth, uh, which is entitled From the Jaws of Giants. Tell us more. Well, I need to work on a better title than I was original working title. Right, you've got two choices with me, let's face it. It's either demons or orcs. In this case, it was demons. So, it is said... That uh, try my point. That the, 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 try again. Though the stories of the demon lords can't be trusted, there is one story that falls through lies like a blade. During the wars of the gods, the king of darkness Baphomet was stuck by the mace of the Lord of Light. Several teeth were struck from his mouth, which landed into the primeval earth. Their sharpness allowed them to burrow deep into the earth, into a location known as the Umbra Depths. At which point, after many, many years, the teeth slowly transformed into the first demon lords. In turn, they created lesser demons from their own teeth, who repeated the process. And pretty soon, the Umbra Depths were filled with an evil which has since ravaged the land and brought the world to its knees several times. It is often said that the courtiest of the demon lords sacrificed their teeth in order to gain favour, though they may dupe to be duped into believing such things. Demons speak many things, the truth is not one of them. This is, this is interesting because it, it's creation myth not for humanity but for the, the monsters humanity is facing. Exactly. Um, the, but, <laughs> I, I love the idea that you know bigger demons you know create um, teeth you know create lesser demons with their teeth which create lesser demons. I can just imagine tiny little elf, it, imps you know getting their teeth out and getting even smaller imps. Um, that I like that very much. So. The, so the cultists, would, are you imagining the players being like a sort of a Cthulhu thing where you're hunting down the cultists or even being the cultists? It's it's more of a the cultists are uh, one of the enemies, which then leads on to finding bigger and bigger things. It's, it's almost your standard D&D, oh, here's your starter demons before we go on to like the Baylor Lords or the Pit Fiends, maybe. Um, one venture hook I did come up with was a tooth is found in the Umbra Depths, an unformed tooth. What do you do with this tooth? Do you destroy it before it becomes a demon lord? Maybe it is just the point where uh, Baphomet can be resurrected. Maybe it could be turned into a force for good, or do you just destroy it? It's maybe a moral choice for the players. Maybe the thing inside isn't necessarily bad. Maybe it's just from the clay of its um, creator it can be made bad. Yeah, I mean, because the important thing with creation myths is that they are actually mythical and therefore, almost by definition, not true. Um, so, <coughs> if it's not your creation myth, um, how much do you accept as truth? Um, you know, do you, you know you find this tooth or whatever, and you know you've got to, the players have got to make that choice. You know, do they believe the creation myth, in which case they definitely have to destroy this tooth? Is there some other, you know, scientific explanation maybe, or has something got corrupted in the telling of the legends and the myths? It actually throws up some interesting choices for the players. Emily, you think you have something to say? So could it just all be a con by the demons? It's so like the demons are well known for not telling the truth. Maybe they but want to they tell want somebody to... what they want to hear. Yeah, they want you to destroy it just because it's holding back something worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe actually that something like a demon loses his teeth, but you know the whole thing about you—you know, you have part of the body of somebody you can control them. That that sort of style of magic. Maybe if you have a demon's tooth, you can destroy the demon. So they come up with this story 
so that everybody else has a reason to try and destroy the teeth when they find them, not knowing actually they're really, really useful against the demons. I, yeah, I was going to uh, essentially say something that Chris was going to say. Is if you're every, everybody knows that demons lie, is, do demons know that demons lie? Because if they do, they could tell the truth <laughs> to make people go, oh, that's a there. All, yes, all yes, civilians yes. are liars. Yeah. The destroyers. We won't turn into something more powerful if you cut our heads off. Don't cut their heads off. Uh, <laughs> that's the impression I had in my brain. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I very much like that, Josh. Uh, it, it, you know, and, and I like the fact that it's creation myth from the other side, and I think that's an important thing to remember, is that every society has a creation myth, so therefore, if you're designing a world, you've got to think about what that society's creation myths are. Okay, I think it's time to move on. So next up, we have... Um, uh, scroll... Emily, um, with the second world. Emily, tell us more. Yep. Ours is not the first time, we are not the first people, and this is not the first world. In the first world, magic was great, but everyone was far too curious. One day the wizard, the greatest of his age, pushed the limits of magic and his world, and destroyed it. The world slowly reformed, humans reformed. Some humans and animals got reformed together, made all the beast men, made all the centaurs, the satyrs. Some animals got blended, creating the first dragons, the first monsters. And now this is left as the second world. There are some bizarre ruins left of the world that was before. And now everything is ruined, and there's no magic left. So it's kind of almost apocalyptic, I can't say the word, apocalyptic um, creation myth. So, so yeah, so it, it, so it would be for a culture, say humanity or whatever, where there's ancient ruins and signs that clearly there was a previous society there, but it's no longer there, and presumably, you know, ruins of great buildings or something like that, which would appear magical, so therefore the survivors would say, well, it used to be magic, clearly they made these great things, but there isn't magic now, so therefore all the magic went away. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Josh? Oops. <laughs> um, some... Briefly, click when you said uh, the whole they're living in a technically post-apocalyptic wasteland. There are, there are some who say that we are living in a death threat and apocalypse because when Rome fell, it was probably the biggest civilization on earth. I can't remember the exact reasoning behind it, but it said that when Rome fell, the world ended, and we're just living in the after effects of the apocalypse. Hmm. I think yeah, I think it was Nero kind of ruined everything. <laughs> I think. Bloody Nero. Yeah. I'm I mean, the, the, there's. Um, I mean, we forget that in ancient civilizations had ancient ruins in them. That you know, at the time of Rome, the pyramids were already two thousand years old. Uh, Stonehenge was similar, sort of like three thousand years old. And Romans had no idea who built the, um, the pyramids and things like that. So it's very. Uh, so yeah, that second world is a very sort of like common idea and a good one to tap because it can add a lot to a world. Uh, Josh, you appear to have written something in Welsh. <laughs> I don't know the word. or I think it's the word, um, so lyrical is the word I'm looking for. It's when describing uh, a continual cycle. Cyclical. Um, <laughs> Cyclical. 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 Word. <laughs> but the point, the point is, um, we're in the second age. Is it inevitable that some wizard will eventually push magic again, leading on to another apocalypse, leading on to another third world? Are we destined to continue this pattern over and over again? That's an interesting idea, because you could have loads of different cultures just built up, and if you were doing a dungeon crawl, you find further and further layers of it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's, I think there's sort of like Numenera is, of course, the Ninth World or something like that. Um, yes. Kristen, I think you were about to make exactly the same comment. <laughs> I was just about to say, I was like, yeah, Numenera is like the ninth world. The game where you're not allowed to call a gun a gun because no one knows what a gun is. <laughs> Literally. Because there's so much stuff that's built up that you can't call a gun a gun because barrels and, you know, grips and handles obviously don't exist. 
or maybe if they do, it's been several millennia, so you have a regular pistol and a laser gun, and maybe they've gone back to crossbows. I don't know. So you can't, yeah. Which is kind of a cool thing, though, when you think about it. Um, that, that idea that you're going to build a world that happens out of the apocalypse of an old one. Um, I have a couple of those stories, but I won't get into those. Yeah, there's a, there's a rich scene there. I mean, I think I think I quite like the idea that specifically doing the second world, um, where you are well enough established to have some understanding of what was before, but not just completely. Oh, we have no idea what was there before. There's some what you might call archaeology has happened, and they have some vague understanding, and possibly yeah, they you could set the adventures around sort of like people starting to discover magic, whatever magic is in that uh, setting again, and, and sort of like the, the whole cycle starting again, as uh, Josh pointed out. Okay, I, th I think, uh, Emily, thank you very much for that. The second world sounds a lot of fun. Um, so, right, okay, we're going to try our um, um, technology here and bring in Jay, who's in Hong Kong, uh, because Hong Kong is inconveniently... 12 hours or so behind us in the UK. Um, Jay, Jay has recorded his video message, so I'm going to attempt to uh, play that using a screen share because Google don't provide you a better option to do it. So hopefully uh, this is going to work. So let me just click screen share. Oops, better get on the right window on the browser and not show you all my personal details. Uh, click on that, share that, hit play. I can hear very little. Okay, we seem to be having some sound problems there. Let me uh, try that one again. Uh, let me just try that. Try and move your headphones, maybe. <laughs> okay. Just... Yeah. Maybe if I do full screen. Uh, no, no, I've pressed the wrong button and I can't see anything at all. Okay, let's give that one more go. Uh, I'll start it from the beginning. Okay, I think we're having uh, some technical problems there in that no one seems to be getting any sound. So uh, what I'll do is I shall uh, read Jay's idea uh, for you. Uh, he was kind enough to uh, type it up. Uh, okay, uh, so... Hang on, so let me make sure I've got... Yep. Uh, so Jay, this is called Pushed Up From Below. In the time of formation, the god Germano found himself mocked and teased by the other gods. He could shape only matter, whereas the other gods could shape energy. Hurt and wounded by their taunts, Germando fled the greater court, um, and determined to find himself a hiding place, he built a world around himself. In it, his war bodily warmth that made the underground warmer, in it, it is his sweat that bubbles up the oceans, it is his breath which causes the winds, it is his movements that shape our landscape, and his aura that fuels our magic. Jamando is not asleep, he simply enjoys his solitude as those prone to deep thought are. Now, Jamando's world is geographically active. It's unknown if a shy god knows of the life that has emerged on his exterior of his home, but that life is very aware of him. 
His every action changes drastically um, the face of the planet. As he moves, mountain ranges form in the matter of years. As he breathes, storms and seasons change directions. For a population struggling to get out of the Middle Ages, uh, the constantly shifting world is a source of both wonder and terror. Sometimes great riches are pushed to the surface, other times entire island chains are drowned as the sea level rises uh, meters in a week. Um, so, so we have a planet uh, which is constantly changing and, and very dynamic in completely unpredictable ways. And this is a creation myth explaining why the planet behaves like this. Uh, there's a sleeping god and when the god moves, um, that is when things happen. Um, so. Emily, um, you had some thoughts on this. Um, so I'd say I really like it because it sounds like a real creation myth, especially for like the South Polynesian islands where it's all about sleeping dark gods. And I really like it because it's, you can create a really open world. Like you said, it's be people trying to almost escape, people trying to survive, people adventuring. It's a very nice open kind of story for you. Yeah, th th that's right. I mean, it, it, you create a very exciting world because you know it's quite a fun one to play. Well, well, your 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 mission is to go to those mountains. They were there last week, but we're not sure they're going to be there by the time you get there. <laughs> yeah, it, it would be a very interesting world. Uh, Josh, you thinking about manipulation? Yeah, um, I think Mark's had a very similar idea. The idea that if he is indeed in the centre of this world, what if you've got a particularly <coughs> powerful magic? user able to say aim a big ass fireball down into a um, crevice where maybe you could just hit him. What happens if he hits and then reacts to that? Can you deliberately manipulate the earth on a very subtle level um, or maybe a very violent level depending on how what you annoy him or how he reacts? Kind of like maybe like a parasite living on a, a body of a, of a horse say, when it's like trying to spot away maybe whatever this thing is. Yeah, the, the, once you've got that creation myth, once they sort of like get some sort of technology or magic where they can change things, inevitably they're going to start doing things. There's still going to be some idiot who thinks, well, I'm going to dig a big hole all the way down and have a chat with him. You know, it's sort of like an inverse Pat Tower of Babel is sort of going to come up, come up, isn't it? Or down. Um, so, uh, Mark, um, uh, oh, sorry, Patrick, a question you have. I had the inevitable question, which which Josh actually happened afterwards, which is what happens when he fatulates? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I love how we maintain a high level of, of debate and idea generation, but it has to be said it is an inevitable question, and I don't know a gaming table in the world where if you had this world, the question wouldn't come up after about it half an hour. <laughs> lived in this world, it is something you would want to know. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, but the question depends whether it's a real creation myth or not. You know, is, is this actually true? Is there really a god underneath this uh, planet? Or is it just some weird uh, planetary thing, you know, there's multiple suns pulling in lots of different directions, which gives you the weird uh, behaviour. Um, so, um, so that'll be an interesting question, you know, which way do you take it? You know, is it sort of, does it produce hurricanes when he farts? Or actually does it turn out that when you investigate it, nothing happens, hurricanes are caused by, you know, weather. Um, so, um, Kristen, um, yeah, you've got a fairly obvious question as well. Mute. Yes, I know. I was going to say, what happens, you know, when, what does he eat? Does he poop? I mean, like, what? Okay, it, it was inevitable after that fart that it was going to happen. Someone had to ask the question. I mean, do gods have bodily functions, I guess? Well, that, that, that's good. To up because, you know, the idea of sacrificing things into volcanoes or into crevasses or, or ravines or whatever else has always existed in all human cultures. So, you know, you could easily see that you know, uh, it's throwing, um, you know, that's how he gets fed. Though, obviously, you're going to think, well, it's got to be a big god. How much energy does he actually need? Yeah, that was my <laughs> next question. I mean, because, you know, if every single town or village on this planet, you know, 
throws a sacrificial maiden or a bunch of goats or several cows, you know, down the biggest crevice they can find. <laughs> Is he eating them alive? <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I love this myth because it throws up so many really obvious questions which, depending what the game world you create, you know, what sort of his technology level, you know, how sophisticated the uh, world is, is going to, be, going to come up and you can bring into the adventure. So, yeah, it's, it's a great setting, this. Um, Mark, do you want to come in on your thoughts? Um, on this one, yeah, well... Oh, the question really is, um, does this guy actually know, or does this god actually know that people are on the surface? And if people pray to him and they sacrifice to him, does it get them stuff? Because that then means, if that's the case, then players have the chance, or characters have the chance, to be able to manipulate him, or have some influence on what happens. So you can say, okay, we, we want this to happen, let's appease um, uh, Germano, or let's try to irritate Germano, or doing that kind of things. It then lends an extra element to the gameplay. <clears throat> that even if you can't do that, the the basic idea still makes for a very dynamic world. This stuff can change all the time. Um, <clears throat> means you can build whatever you like. So the uh, I can't talk. Um, that the <clears throat> that's kind of something. The question is, can the cat influence him, and does he know there's anyone there? I think it's a better setting if he does exist. Yes, it, it becomes very dull if actually if, if all it is is planetary um, alignments are sort of doing strange things to the planet. Um, and actually, if there is a real god, it, it, yeah, I mean, do, does he know he exists? People exist? Is he interested? Is it like an infestation that, you know, one day he plans to sort of dust himself down and um, go off and do something, which ties us to... Um, you know, end of a world myths, which is uh, something else we can do one week uh, as a think tank. So yeah, lots of good ideas on that. So uh, time to move on. Uh, we're running out of time. Um, so Mark, um, your idea, please. This this won't take long because I kind of threw it together. Uh, it's based around the idea of the cargo cult. Uh, for those not familiar, this is where this happened on Earth allegedly a few times, where some. Uh, more primitive civilization or isolated tribe has suddenly encountered sophisticated, uh, sophisticated people. So, for example, an island tribe where an American plane has landed or crashed nearby and dropped some cargo, and they suddenly started doing things like building airstrips or things with try to try to summon the plane again. They've kind of built a religion around this kind of um, <clears throat> this kind of lost cargo or this uh, or this airplane. So, I think you're trying to scale that up a little bit. So, the idea is it kind of stands at the moment is that the players find themselves there. Tribe living in a rainforest, um, <clears throat> with this matter of kind of old, rusted, uh, various modern items. Their belief is that these things were dropped there by the sky people, who came in houses lifted by fire, which gives you a fairly obvious look into obviously humans or other people brought these things here. What I was thinking was that something that they, the players can find out as they investigate things will get into the long plot is that they are actually the, the descendants of um, failed human colonists, uh, crossbred with natives. So at some point in the long past, humans tried to colonize this place. It failed flat out. Um, think the very early American colonies before the natives actually, you know, helped them. <coughs> um, uh, but they just fell flat out, and eventually the colony collapsed, and the people, just, certain people, just bred into the species, and they are part of what remains. So they've. Uh, all the things like the old buildings and the ship itself remains, but it's this stuff that they can find. So it gives you a long plot to kind of find, uncover kind of really what's happening with uh, where these people came from. But like the idea of people not playing humans for a change. Yeah. So so it's, it's a world where effectively the um, as as they've raised themselves to sort of like as like out of primitive lives so are big enough to have creation myths, they've yeah. come across these things and they've got no explanation for them. So they've sort of come up with this cargo cult just based on the rumours and whatever's been passed down. So they've got this myth of the sky people who came down and uh, set up a city and then bred and mixed in with the people. Um, that's kind of where they're, that's sort of the moment they consider the people to have been uplifted. That was their great religious um, sort of revelation moment, which obviously is the humans coming and their colony failing. Yeah, uh, it's been good. Uh, Emily, uh, you have some couple of thoughts on this. Um, I'm just thinking you could, as I say, you did mention kind of set it on an alien world or even in a dimension, say, into a fantasy world, like, it would be quite interesting to see what the descendants of, say, 
you have like your players are half elves who don't understand we you know that they're part human and especially if you go for a very like tribalistic society you can have a nice kind of play on tropes there where the great elder race that the elves believe in are actually humans uh, so sort of reversing it, so actually the, you know, the elves are sort of like the lesser race as it turns out, and then the humans are the greater race. I, I like that. Um, I, actually, I was just thinking that, uh, Mark, I think this ties into your idea, was it from last week, where you had uh, a magical society going by gates and populating oh. the universe? <laughs> and it just occurs to me that, yeah, it could be one of their failed colonies. Yeah, you can kind of mix, mix that stuff in. I think it's... There you go. I'll, I'll certainly build a setting week by week. <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, okay, um, so right, uh, let, very quickly, um, we'll do my idea just to wrap up. We'll be nice and quick on this one. I've gone for a slightly different um, concept of a creation myth, uh, but still a myth. And so this is called the um, Mars 3, and not as what I typed in the document of Mars Threads, uh, the Mars Three, and this is an extract from a human history, an introduction, and this is Chapter Nine, Mars and Beyond. Though the first manned landing was in 2031, it wasn't until 2064 that the first substantial effort was made to establish a permanent base on Mars. Unlike the lunar and Earth orbital bases, which were you know quite handy to Earth really, and therefore we could send crews and rotate them back after six months, Mars would go be a one-way trip for the settlers, and they really would be settling. Um, and but before we could do this first wave of settlers, they had to send a Pathfinder mission out there just to start the robots and um, get the you know start building the base so the settlers had something which. Uh, be there when they arrived. And the Pathfinders, they were going to sort of like return home before the settlers arrived um, and leave everything ready for the settlers. Anyway, because uh, things went wrong while they were building the base, they were there longer than they planned. And then at the last minute, the base developed an air leak and the, these, this Pathfinder mission is stuck with a decision. If they leave now, they might just be able to get back to Earth on their own spaceship. Um, but that would leave the settlers in a terrible state when they arrived because the base would be basically without oxygen. Uh, but if they stayed and fixed the leak, then that's going to be three extra people in the base and that's going to stretch the demands and again put the settlers at risk. So the three uh, pathfinders did the only thing which made sense. Um, they fixed the leak and then in a Captain Oates sort of way, they walk out of the base and leave it behind and go out and die on the surface of Mars, um, leaving all the oxygen and food they would have used on their return uh, trip for the settlers so that the settlers have um, you know, a better chance of survival. Now, ever since that, uh, the settlers arrived um, and that sacrifice, Mars has been occupied. And now there's a billion people on the planet, but Mars still remembers these um, three pathfinders. and. The three three hands, the three helping hands of the uh, the, uh, the Pathfinder's mission is on the Martian flag, and <clears throat> the, there's a phrase, you know, invoking the three. So you know, oh, that's good enough for the three, or you know, the you know, it's something the three would do is a, is a sign of praise, you know, inviting you know spirit and uh, mentality um, of you know of Mars. It sort of embodies their entire society in much ways, sort of like the founding fathers do for America. Um, so that's my idea. Um, any quick ideas? Uh, Christian, you've got a comment to come in very quickly? Good job. That was, that was impressive. Um, just because I never thought about, you know, the idea of a mythos being about the sacrifice of three pe of anyone. Normally gods get sacrificed, but they, you know, magic and they pop back. But those were relatively human and they died. They're like, nope, we're not going to need all this extra food and, you know, water. We're just going to go out into the planet and die. Um, yeah, it, it, it's an incredible um, uh, sacrifice. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't, it, you might not know, get the Captain Oates uh, reference, which is Scott of the Antarctic. Uh, in order to help Scott try and get home, Captain Oates left the tent and died in the snow and ice because he was slowing the team down. As it happened... Wow. He didn't help. They all died anyway. But it, 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 he it, tried. 
yeah, yeah. In British culture, it's it's you know it's one of those stories you learn as a kid. It, it's quite a big part of a culture. So I'm sort of like riffing on that idea. Um, Emily, uh, so Emily, quickly, zealous. Um, yeah, I can't spell. Just saying, how? What have you got, zealots? Kind of like a really serious cult developed around the free, and it's very much like, oh, if you're not, if you're not standing to their values, you know, you're not one of us. Like, how far could you take it if, like, a proper cult drives them all different cults taking on one of the free? Oh yeah, I mean, I was thinking when you said cults, I thought, yeah, if you had a cult almost like. Uh, insanely communistic, you know, you have to give up everything, you know, to help your fellow yeah. man, you know, so like one of, or one of those sort of like um, Christian uh, sects where they sort of live in poverty. But yeah, then you get the spit, you actually get the personalities of the three different ones, you know, whose idea was it to leave, who was the yeah. bravest of the three, and wars because of it. <laughs> good. Um, very quickly, Josh. Yeah, um, <clears throat> what it actually turned out that I, like, in the inventory or somewhere on base, they actually had a, a patching material. So their sacrifice was was actually meaningless, but this particular bit of knowledge is kept from the general public because they like to keep the story alive that these people sacrifice themselves. Yes, the, the, the sort of... Um that, that sort of uh, knowledge, yeah. The uh, yeah, if you sort of like had an adventure around, you found some archaeological evidence, and it threw into question the, the whole basis of your society. Yeah, um, it's like it's like a bit from Last Crusade with the uh, Brotherhood of the Cruciform Sword. When uh, so, oh, we've been here protecting this knowledge for years. And you've got a secret. You've got some of the NPC uh, play characters start encountering this new secret society that no one knew about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, that's great. Okay, uh, right, we're running out of time rapidly, so it's time to wrap up. Uh, I'm going to pass over in a moment to Emily to do the pluses and deltas, and this is where uh, we go around the group and we say one thing we liked about today's meeting, and not one thing we didn't like, but one thing maybe we'd want to do differently or improve upon next time, and we'll each throw in. So, uh, Emily, will you, will you host the pluses and deltas for us? Certainly, so let's jump right into it. So, Chris, what's your plus and delta for this week? Oh, I'm going to um, um, take the easy fruit uh, this week and go for uh, Kristen, who, uh, lovely to have you. It's always great to have more people in, in the group, and you had some great ideas, so we, uh, we will definitely be uh, wanting you to come back and uh, look forward to you being here in the future. Uh, my delta was that... I can't understand why we can't play videos back and do things like that. And Google, I don't understand you. Uh, so, yeah, my delta is Google. Okay, now on to Josh. Uh, two things for the pluses. Always great to meet new people. And it's always good to discuss um, world building, particularly creation myths and anything to do with the such. Uh, deltas. Uh, it's too far for us to genuinely travel to Google headquarters and throw a proper wobbler over their awful, awful service. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's going to be everyone's today. And um, yeah, Kristen. Besides meeting all of you, um, uh, I don't know. Deltas, minuses. Yeah, Google. That 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 was no. I I think I think we need to like charter a flight. To, to Redwood, California, and be like, Google, get your act together, or Google and YouTube, because they apparently have not the same exact company. So, Mark. Also, yay! Emily's having a baby. Yay! Okay. <laughs> um. Yes. Congratulations, Emily. First time I actually spoke to you since you since you announced that. Congratulations, Pat and Emily. Um, that pluses for this sent, uh, this thing in particular. Uh, Going to echo Josh. The world building aspect is an awful lot of fun. I like picking up the blank state and building something up. Um, <clears throat> Picks up when we were, were thrown into other things. Uh, deltas. Dum dum dum. dum uh, we're still not making use of internet or social media to generate further ideas, which we can then refer to here and then bounce them back and forth. I quite enjoyed what we did with Reddit and so on um, a few months ago. I'd like us to get back into that. <coughs> but um, yeah, that's about it. Thanks, Dickie. And Patrick. 
That's me. Uh, my delta is that I hugely fluffed up the intro. Hugely fluffed up the intro. Um, my, yeah, my plus is new people. I like new people. I, I, yeah, a new person, rather, but even so. Um, and, yeah, uh, I, I just liked a lot of that. All of it, really. <laughs> Doing the same again. <laughs> okay, so it looks like it's me. Um, my plus is, again, having a new person. Yay. And also, again, echoing everyone else, I fucking love world building, so I really enjoyed this one. Um my Delta, again, it's just a shame we can't get Google and YouTube to work because I was really, although we got to hear it anyway, it was a shame we couldn't hear it come from, I forgot his name, how can I forget his name? From Mark's brother. Hey. Hey. <laughs> I'm blaming that on baby brain. Um, so on that note, I'll hand back to Chris. I don't, I, the baby brain is no excuse because I've done it. I, I, I was... Um, I had employed this new person in my company and I was showing them around and I introduced to one of the existing employees who had only worked for me like 18 months and I walked into the office and say, Mark, and say, this is, and completely forgot my employee's name and I just stood there looking like an idiot, thinking, you know, to, to everybody, you know, I can't remember my employee's name, so no, I, I know exactly what it's like, Emily. Um, right, okay, quickly wrap up, um, thank you everybody. It's been a brilliant evening. I have really enjoyed tonight. World building is fun. Um, yeah, we'll um, next week um, we are going to do superheroes, I believe. But I think Jay has got a plan for superheroes, and we're going to do archetypes and things like that uh, to do with superhero creation. Um, and then I think maybe in a couple of weeks' time we should revisit sort of this topic, but do the other end and do uh, myths about the end of the world because you know everyone has a myth, you know that you know, the second coming or whatever it is, Ragnarok. So that would be a nice, like, bookend to uh, this video. So there we are, very slightly over time. Thank you very much, everybody, and we will see you next week, uh, 7 o'clock UK time on Friday. Don't forget to subscribe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.